Um, I might just uh, begin by respectfully acknowledging the Gubi Gubi and Ndambi people and the traditional country on which this event is taking place and the elders both, both past and present. I also recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. Thank you. So thanks for that, Melissa. I'm really excited to welcome everyone to today's webinar and thank you all for joining us. This is a genuine thank you because I acknowledge how difficult these times are at the moment. And of course, our primary concern is always uh, our health. But COVID has also had a huge impact on our finances and employment too. And so I guess that's where Morton Bay Libraries wanted to try and support our community. So how do we go about that? Well, we get the experts in and that's how we arrive at today's talk with author, CEO, uh, columnist, media personality, I guess. And, and in fact, really interestingly um, and, and great as a role model for my, my daughter, um, one of the Financial Review's 100 Women of Influence as well. So that's Melissa Brown. Welcome, uh, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Now you can't see Melissa just at the moment. I'll just give uh, Melissa uh, an introduction, and then um, and we'll, and then we will. Uh, I'll hand over. So thanks for joining us, Melissa. Now we're going to have a chat today based around your uh, book, "Budgets Don't Work, But This Does," and that's published by Alan and Unwin, and available now around Australia on ebook as well um, mm -hmm. that I've been listening to. So that's fantastic. Um, all the way through this um, uh, presentation or through this webinar, you're able to go to the Q&A section. So at the bottom of your screen, I think it's at the bottom, there should be a feature where you can type in a question for Melissa. And we'll get to that just uh, in, in a few moments time. Uh, but feel free to put your questions in at any point. They don't just have to be questions. If you have any comments or personal experiences um, that you wish to share, then feel free to, to pop that in too. Uh, thank you for that. Now, uh, I guess, Melissa, just wanted to give, uh, wanted to begin if, if you could give us a bit of an overview of your book, you know, so what was the motivation for writing it um, and maybe a little bit around the process and, and your experience of going through that process and, and uh, yeah, and what, what would the reader would kind of um, expect, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, um, I did an interview a couple of weeks ago and the journalist at the time said, this feels like a money psychology book as much as it is a money help book. And I really feel that that's a beautiful description because there's two quotes that I based my research for the book on um, and that drove me. One is Brene Brown's quote. So Brene Brown is a shame researcher from the U University of Houston. So it a shame researcher might be a strange person for uh, someone to fangirl over, but that's certainly um, how I feel about Brene. And she said, what we know matters, but who we are matters more. So what we know matters, but who we are matters more. Um, and the second quote is by Carl Jung, who said, um, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we'll call it fate. And what I know from dealing with finances is that a lot of us are behaving in a way where we're perpetually frustrated with how we're behaving. We're frustrated at either at the age and stage that we think we should be at. We're frustrated because we feel like we're in a sabotage loop or we just are a bit frustrated that we can't get it together financially. And what I know from my research is that part of that is, is far less to do with the seven steps to sorting out your finances and far more to do with who we are and what's driving us, what's behind our financial decision-making process. So I brought out a, um, a book a few years ago, and I won't swear, but it's called Un F You Finance It. <laughs> and that was very much the precursor to this book. Um, where I started to unpack these concepts. But this book, I guess, is the, the result of three years of research and thinking for me, where I don't just talk about concepts, but I give my experience. I tell my stories and I tell the stories of friends and clients in it. So you can actually see 
uh, what's happening. And you can see, you can read their money stories. You can read how they behave with money. They can look, you can see what a money type looks like in action and what great habits different ones have created as a result. And that's, yeah, the culmination of all that is this book. Um, but the reason uh, the reason it's called budgets don't work is because if we look at food, um, and I very much believe there's an analogy between food and money. Yeah, I believe you that, that you pull that out a lot in your book. That kind of analogy between food and food and money, like that's pointed out really early absolutely. on. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I feel like how often like we're not silos. You know, we don't operate in silos. So how we often behave in one part of our life often mimics other parts of our lives. And I opened the book with an analogy around food where I said, I can't walk into an office building or I can't walk into a block in um, Moreton Bay and say, right, everyone in this block, you're all getting the same quantity of food, the same quality of food, um, the same diet. I don't care if you're training for a marathon, if you're sedentary, if you've got intolerances or allergies or what gender you are or what have you, you're all getting fed the same. So I think we all understand that that approach doesn't make sense. And yet when it comes to our finances, a lot of us are offer, uh, operating out of that approach. We're like, just give me the seven steps. Just tell me what to do. Um, just give me the one size fits all. And certainly the financial advice world behaves that way. They bucket us into spenders and savers. And if we're spenders, we think we're bad. And if we're savers, we think we're good. So for me, it was busting that whole myth right open and saying, well, it's we're more complex than that. And instead, I've come up with this uh, concept I've called your financial phenotype, which is combined of your money story, your money environment and your money type. That's and kind that's of like your nature versus not uh, nurture versus nature, that kind of thing that you, anal uh, you know, you make that analogy there a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So. I talk about um, how I've got th two siblings, uh, a sister and a brother. We all came out of the same household, wildly different approaches to money, life, everything. Um, so it always fascinated me, is it more nurture or is it more nature? Um, and in the book, I unpack that a little bit to say, well, which one drives us? And in the end, really, for most of us, I believe it's a combination. And the nurture side of it is your money story and your money environment. And the nature side of it is your money type, that inherent way that we behave. And certainly when it if when we come to that inherent way, you know, I'm I'm an introvert. Um, you could probably call me a raging introvert. <laughs> like it's just COVID has been my happy place. No, I can yeah. have an excuse to not to hug, not to touch, not to see people. Well, it looks like you've got the perfect place to hold up in the back there. Beautiful Absolutely, book case. Absolutely, just and me and my books. Nice. <laughs> Wonderful. But I can't, you know, as someone that loves reading and seclusion and that sort of thing, I can come out and be extroverted for a period of time. Um, I can speak, I can talk, I can... Uh, can come to a party and be quite extroverted, but I recharge as an introvert. And I think that's where we, when it comes to introversion and extroversion, we get that. But when it comes to our money types, it's understanding in that same way that we have these inherent tendencies for how we recharge our energy. When it comes to money, we also have these inherent ways where we might think other people are doing money wrong. Whereas actually it would just be wrong for us, which is problematic then if we're in relationship with someone, um, because we may be thinking they're doing money wrong when really they've grown up with a money story wildly different than us, or they have a money type that's different from us. So I feel like this book gives us a new language around money, gives us a new understanding, um, but I didn't want it just to be an ego book. I don't want it just to be, oh, well, that's good to know about myself. So the last part of the book is, well, what habits should I develop as a result of that? Um, and what habits can I have for my particular money type and my particular money story? Yeah, thank you. So I, um, 
So we we uh, we might get in uh, a little bit later on uh, just around some of the habits and some more mm. practical things that you know you might suggest to our customers that they could be doing now to set themselves up further as we go through this pandemic. But but more generally, anyway, I mean, obviously finances are a, um, a constant. Um, worry for some uh, concern for others but if but in most cases it's certainly a big part of our lives so so there's a lot of these things that you know obviously are relevant now because of the pandemic but will be great lifelong skills that maybe many of us don't actually learn or at least uh, spend the time because you you mentioned in in the beginning of your book about uh, a vital step that many people kind of miss which is um, going through uh, I suppose an introspection of understanding who we are and why we behave the way that we do you've kind of touched on it a, a little bit before and um, and so yeah we, we we may not have gone through that that step and so I wonder before we get into some of the more practical stuff could you tell us a bit about did you go through that was it a process for you or did you have that kind of aha moment you know did you suddenly mm. like become enlightened or something <laughs> in some way I think it's something that I've all I've been unpacking around for myself for quite some time um but but I, I guess I just thought I was a little bit odd at first we know I did have a very um grown up with a bit of trauma and all sorts of stuff. So I thought that my experience was unique around having to go and unpack that. And so therefore I would have a different relationship with money. I would have a money story and a money type and a money experience that perhaps is unusual. But what I've discovered is that it's not. Um, most of us have a money story or have an experience with money that is so helpful to unpack. And when I started talking about this with my clients or when I started talking about this with friends and relatives, I discovered that this isn't something that they thought about either. They just, and they're not, because we don't have a language around money, because it's not something that we're taught, we're taught to talk about. And in fact, we're kind of shushed about it. You know, we're told that's not polite dinner conversation. <laughs> yeah. So therefore we don't we don't have these awakenings and these realizations about ourselves. Um, so for me, it was a gradual realization, but probably the biggest aha moment for me was that other people had a wealth of money story and money type that once they unpacked that was actually transformational and could really break those habits and move them along and quicken their financial success. So that's when I got, well, that's when I started to get excited about it. Yeah, interesting. You talk a little bit there um, about, uh, about the, um, about coming from the same household as, as your, your siblings and having a very different approach to money and so on. And so that's the kind of, you know, an interesting uh, experiment around nurture or nature and so on. So uh, in in your book, you talk a lot. In fact, that the whole thing is kind of split in, well, the first two parts are uh, nurture and then the second part is nature. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about that kind of nature and nurture and how they mm. kind of relate to the your 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 term phenotype, I guess. So. Yeah, so a phenotype in nature. Because it sorry, I, I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, it, look, this was initially going to be a money type book, but I, it just felt wrong. So it was something that I just I kept kept shelving. So I was like, no, it's more complex than that. And what I worked out when I discovered a fen what a phenotype was. So in nature, a phenotype is the observable um, combination of, nat of nature and nurture. So it might be looking at you and I can see the colour of your eyes. I can't quite see your height because you're sitting down, um, but I can make those quick observations. But what we want to do is understand what's behind that. So in the book, I talk about how whilst most of us can understand uh, the phenotype of skin darkening from skin from going out in the sun, we might not be able to understand uh, from looking at a flamingo the fact that its feathers are born white and they turn pink. We see it, but we don't understand why. And the financial phenotype, it's both nature and nurture, but again, it's understanding why. It's understanding why are those things happening and unpacking it and asking the questions always, is that serving me or sabotaging me? And when we're looking at nurture, I think we do that best through money stories and also our money environment. You know, we might have grown up in a particular environment that 
unhelpful or helpful financially, but it's what environment are we creating for ourselves now? And is that actually helpful or unhelpful? And then when it comes to nature, it's most of us don't walk around with a team of scientists analysing why we're behaving the way we do in our finances. So I found that what I did was split it into four different money types, of which most of us are hybrids. And the, uh, the concept is that you do the quiz and you figure out which money type you are. Are you a worker, a creator, a discerner or a relator? And then most importantly, how am I showing the strengths of that type? How am I showing the weaknesses of that type? And what habits can I create that will actually really benefit me because I am that, because I have those tendencies? Oh, sorry, there you go. I'm clicking, not clicking <laughs> mute again. I'm terrible. I mean, in, co in, in lockdown, I've been on Zoom every day I, and I still managed to, 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 to miss the, the mute. But um, so without giving too much away, because honestly, I really recommend people uh, go in and, and pick up your book and have a read. I've, um, I've been fortunate that I've got about two thirds of the way through. And, um, you know, I certainly it's helping me understand my relationship with my partner and, and how her approach to money is, you know, different to my own. And in fact, we uh, without sharing too much information, we actually have separate amounts of uh, money that is used for, you know, things that are not critical to our family. We both contribute to a sort of central kind of things so we've got this shared understanding but also appreciating that we have different uh, approaches to money and, and, and value things differently and um, so uh, but but just moving on a little bit we you mentioned so the reason I say pick up your book and so on is because I appreciate that you don't want to you know kind of we don't want to go through everything in the book there wouldn't be enough time there's so much uh, content <laughs> there is and, a lot in there yeah. yeah but you want to give us a little bit of um uh, an understanding of what the four categories are like the worker the creator the designer the relator maybe some of our customers could relate to those uh, mm. with, with a, a sentence or two on what what each one might be or what the traits are yeah absolutely so part of it is understanding you but as you said part of it's also understanding your partner um, because relationships australia says money is the number one thing we fight about it we fight about it an average twice a month so imagine if you could yeah, have wow. a different language and a curious conversation rather than that you're doing it wrong conversation. Whereas your partner might not be doing it wrong, but it, you just don't understand their approach. So it's figuring out how to be safe together with money and how that you how can you both feel supported. So a worker um, is the most pragmatic of the money types and they are all about personal exertion. So I, I'm all about being busy and nine to five and, um, and making money through my personal exertion. The creator is the most idealistic of the money types. So they'll, words like manifesting um, and mantras uh, uh, is their sort of language. Um, and their kind of concept is they'll imagine and dream their way to success. Uh, discerner of which I am is probably the most judgmental of the money types, <laughs> most cynical. <laughs> so it's getting that out of your head and, and realising don't overthink, don't overanalyse and don't judge actually having that forward momentum. Um, but they're all about their smarts. That's how they'll be able to um, financially get ahead. And I don't mean by that their intelligence. It could be street smarts or book smarts. Um, and the final money type is the relator, who's the most empathetic of the money types. So they're connectors um, and they're collaborators. And for them, that can be a strength, but it can also be a weakness because they can be the one most prone to rescue. Um, and for them, it's about putting their financial oxygen masks on so that they could then long-term look after those around them. Yeah, it, that's really interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess that takes, a, you know, it comes back to um, each of us, having a little you know going through your book doing the quiz having a little bit of a think and an introspection about what these things are but i guess um it's also uh, important to acknowledge that you're maybe your um you change as you go on do you know what i mean so so at different times because i can think mm -hmm. what i was like at university what i was like when in my 20s now i'm in my 30s and i have a young daughter my you know kind of approach is changing slightly as as well you know maybe absolutely maybe, you know, so. and you probably find that your inherent money type won't change i believe most of us are hybrids so we'll have a, a dominant and a lesser but it might be that you'd lean more on one than the other. Right, I see. Um, 
But it, what I absolutely believe is that as you grow and you develop those life experiences, your money story will change. Uh, yeah. And it will be capturing uh, different money stories and, and aligning them to you and your money environment will change. And then again, it's asking that question, is that serving me or sabotaging me? And what I certainly see is, particularly as people get older, there's that comparison culture that starts to come in, the whole keeping up with the Joneses, where the Joneses aren't necessarily next door, they're potentially on this device on our phones. <laughs> <laughs> So it's making sure that we're protecting ourselves and setting up a money environment that's serving us and not sabotaging us. Yeah, right. That's that's yeah. OK, thanks for that. There's a lot to kind of think about there and think about, mm. how, you know, what your story is and your money story. That's the that's the term that, that you mention a lot as well, your money story, which makes it very personal, which comes back to that concept around, uh, you know, each of it, not a one f size fits all, you know, that it's each yeah. our individual story. So um, I, I guess. Uh, with that in mind, um, I, I kind of want to move th th this whole webinar is going to be a little bit talk about about the book, which we've kind of done, but also, you know, kind of maybe we can um, uh, now we've got you take get a few tips and tricks <laughs> from you as well, you know, because, of, you know, I guess, there's that, yeah, there's, there's that a element. little pandemic going on at the moment, which means we're all uh, we're all a little financially stressed. So. That's yeah. right. Well, I mean, and, and that interesting. So that comes to our first, I guess, question in a more practical sense. I mean, we can't predict pandemics, of course, um, but what it's shown is that things like pandemics can change the environment that we operate in so quickly. You could be out of work, you know, have this most secure job and, and you know, you could be working in an airport, you know, and it's a perfectly very secure job. And that changes, you know, almost overnight with the prospect of having no air travel for a year or two. I mean, you, you you just couldn't con comprehend that, you know, yeah. only six months ago. So how could you possibly, you know, position yourself to, to, to or what are some of the habits that you should, we, 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 we could engage with to position ourselves to better withstand something like that? So when it comes to the current financial environment, I think there's a twin thing we should be doing. One is doing the urgent. So it's let's make sure that we're protected today. So we're financially protected and how I think we're most protected from because none of us know what's going to be happening in three months time or six months time or 12 months time is making sure we have a buffer of funds. Mm -hmm. So making sure that um, you work out how much does it cost you to live each month and I'm not talking hairdressing and kids sport and all the rest of it. I'm talking mortgage and utilities and uh, or rent um, school fees so the essentials groceries and working out how times that by three and making sure that we have a buffer of three months worth of expenses. Because if you think about how you felt when the pandemic happened back in March, stimulus payments hadn't been suggested yet. And most people panicked because the stats are that most of us only had two weeks worth of savings. That's all we had. So of course you're going to panic if you only had two weeks worth of expenses of cash in the bank. Yeah. So the thing that you can do to have that sleep and night factor and protect yourself is start to develop that buffer. Mm. So set up a bank account, call it your buffer and start automating money to that. It doesn't matter if it's only $20 a pay, start to get that buffer in place so yeah. that you don't have that panic. Um, the other thing I'd go, do is go back through three months worth of expenses or six months, swap, pause and cancel. So swap those things for maybe a cheaper option. Um, pause those things that you're not using at the moment and cancel those things that were nice to have, but you don't need to have anymore. Um, and certainly if you've got kids, I'm really suggesting to families that there was so much activity pre-pandemic where it was almost insane that kids were busier than parents were. So sit yeah. your kids down and say, look, you know that this is not business as usual. You know this is not life as usual. So we want you to pick one thing that you're going to do. You used to do four, but now we want you to pick one thing. So then there's agency uh, for the kids because they get to choose, but the cost of that is reduced. Um, so swap, pause and cancel expenses so that then our cost of living is lower. And I, I would just as usual. That's what I would also say. I mean, I know from my daughter is that that the um, 
level of fun or engagement or getting yeah. out there it doesn't change at all she's not she's no yeah. you know she's, she, she's only out. young but she's not missing out you know it's not yeah, yeah not at all like, that's a she's... common uh, story that I've heard from families is just how much they've enjoyed this time mm -hmm. and how their kids aren't missing out they're making their own fun which is what we used to do back in the day <laughs> before it was all so orchestrated um so I definitely do those two if I was getting more money so the, the other thing is some people are benefiting from the pandemic. They're either part time and they're receiving more funds because of JobKeeper or their businesses are safe or they're in a they're in a business where they're actually doing better. Um, so what I would suggest is that you really start to build that savings amount because there are going to be opportunities as a result of the pandemic. Certainly if I was a young person and saving for a house, keep saving for that house because potentially prices are going to drop. If I was thinking that I might have wanted to invest in the share market before, then start doing that if that was part of your plan, because we've seen the share markets dropped and so part of that's been on sale. So it's realising that we don't want to stop our activity as a result of pandemic. We just need to realise it's not business as usual. Make sure we have savings so we can take advantage of opportunities, but we also have buffers so that we don't have that panic, can't sleep at night. And then the long-term work, so that's the urgent work, but the important work is the, the stuff that you, the deeper work. So understanding your money story, understanding your money type, cleaning up your money environment, setting up great money habits going forward so that you do have a far better relationship with money and you're not stuck in this sabotage loop where you can't quite get yourself together financially. And I think more and more people have been motivated and, and incentivized to deal with their money because before the pandemic, we kind of didn't need to worry about it because times were good. Whereas now there's kind of a really good incentive <laughs> to become financially more aware. So we want to start doing that for ourselves. Oh, you're a mute. <laughs> Yeah. Definitely. And 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 just to remind everyone as well, don't forget you can pop your questions. I'm going to have a couple coming through. You can pop your questions into the Q&A uh, feature of, of here and we can ask, ask those. Uh, it's also a bit tricky for me, Melissa, because I am, as well as monitoring the Q&A and, and speaking with you, trying to make notes myself <laughs> to go and go, well, I'm not going to, you know, kind of pass up this opportunity to do I exactly what you're saying, which is think about because, you know, in the pandemic, you know, things we were locked down we couldn't go anywhere and I was yeah. saving money it was fantastic yep. and you suddenly go actually because Saturday rolls around I've got my daughter for the day we just go out to the shops you know you just kind yeah. of go and that's where you go and 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 you couldn't do that um and not that I have lots of money to spend just that you know just incidentals lunch for example you know would would be a classic one and instead of yeah. 40 50 dollars that you know you've somehow managed to spend you know you, you've just had a sandwich <laughs> yeah so it's I'm just those little things that, so the pandemic could be even if you've uh, found yourself for load or lost your job or something could be there could be some element of silver lining there and and as well you talk a little bit about that kind of buffer and it made me think as well that that's you know it's not just financial that has a mental well-being as well a mental yeah. kind of um a well-being element to it as well because if you're you find yourself in work where you don't want to be in that work you've got that opportunity you've got choices my dad always said that education uh, wasn't about not having a job uh, like, um, you know, whatever you're working in retail, it was about having a choice about what you wanted to do. And if you want to, uh, you know, work in this job or that job, then um, and you have that choice and that that's fantastic and it's something that we that some of us are privileged to have not everyone has that opportunity but if but so that's it's really interesting it's just getting the kind of the the juices flowing you know I when you say these that. things so so the, the i guess I've got the question for you which is so you i mean it's intriguing the title of your book you know uh, budgets don't work but this does so so it's quite uh you know provocative in that set you know in the sense that many of us go you know, going well okay we might not be good at money but i know we've got to set a budget up and then you don't set up a budget because you you know you don't stick to it it's like a diet right you don't stick yeah. to it. then you feel bad that you've not stuck to it and you do yeah. mention these things so if uh, so you should have financial goals um what what kind of goals should they be and, and how can you meet them if you don't set up a budget you know like <laughs> 
<laughs> how do you how are you meant to do that you know I like just try and generally throw money into the account and hope for the best no. That's, no 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 i love that so if i um so during covid i absolutely uh have put on my COVID five um and i also stopped exercising and what have you so i said i don't calorie count i don't i don't believe in any of that so i just decided i need to start eating better and moving more um but when it comes to our finances what we want to do is figure out what our goals are so and that's where those goals are going to be unique to you my goal uh my financial goal many years ago was that by the time I hit 50, I wanted the option to work or not. Um, and I wanted to do it in such a way that it wasn't, um, you know, I could still enjoy the things that I loved. Um, and I could also set my life up in such a way. So I've purposefully child free. Um, and I have a house in the blue, beautiful Blue Mountains down in New South Wales and an apartment in the city. So it was something where was intentional and very different than what other people might. Your goals might be very different. They might be uh, daughter in private school, own your own home. Um, who knows? <laughs> He's going, no. <laughs> but uh, my sister's goals, uh, she's got three boys uh, that she wants to be able to, well, she was supposed to go to the States and do some work over there. So it starts with goals that you're excited about and you want them to be your goals and not your parents and your peers or your or society's goals. Because a lot of the time we do things because we think that's the next step and that's what we think we should have to do. And instead it's breaking that and saying, you know what? Part of the beautiful thing about living in this country is we actually get to choose what we want to do. So, so start being honest. And I talk about this in the book working out what you want to do. And once you figure out what you want to do, it's then working out, okay, well, what does my life look like now? Because if my goal was to retire when I was 50, but I had absolutely nothing at 33, which was actually the truth for me, then I've got some work to do. Um, and then once you work out that three and five year milestones, if you like, it's bringing it back to 12 month goals. So your 12 month goal might be, I need to get rid of all my credit card debt, or it might be I need to save $15,000 towards a house or whatever it might be. And from that, it's about setting up your finances in such a way to reach that goal. So again, there's no budget, but it's working out what are my everyday bill, like what are my bills and making sure they get sent to a bank account. So that's the budget part of it is understanding how much my life costs, how much my bills are. So they get automated automatically. The second part is of that goal work, of, of that 12 months worth of savings or paying off debt or whatever that I want to achieve, automating that so that that just happens. So ten, that, that $10,000 goal, that's going to mean I have to put almost $200 a week and I'm going to automate that. And then the third is that I eat what's left. I call it eating what's left, but I then live with what's left. And that comes out of your everyday account. And I talk about bank accounts to set up in the book. And I also talk about the three basics account everyone should have, which is your everyday account, your bills and your savings account. And then depending on your money type, you'll have more. And then the where, where, it, where the budget part of it and the fact that you don't need to budget comes in is you then just live from the everyday account. So if there's $300 a fortnight left, then that has to pay for groceries and the rest of my life. If it doesn't, then I have two choices. One is I reduce my goals. I ask, do I really want them? And maybe I just give myself a longer term time frame, or I figure out how I can increase my income or decrease my expenses so that I meet those goals. Maybe I start a side hustle. Maybe I figure out another stream of income. Maybe I get a second job. Maybe I go and ask my boss for a raise or I reduce my expenses. So, so it's, it's, and that's the difference. It means that I can then live from this everyday account kind of guilt free. And where I like this approach is if I want, it kind of reminds me of when I was in my twenties, if I really want a pair of shoes, then I will eat real, I would eat rice for the rest of the week. 
Um, whereas now as adults, we kind of figure that, well, we've got the credit card there. I should have the shoes. And also if I want to go out for lunch with my daughter and spend 60 bucks, I should be able to do that too. But it's working out we can't have everything. So it's getting rid of the credit and sticking our everyday expenses and everyday spending to what's left, which is our everyday account. And that's where people will split that up further to holidays accounts and fun accounts and more. But the idea is that because we've sent our bills across, because we've sent our savings across, we're looking after future and current self, and then we're just living with what's left. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, it, it is It is uh, tricky though, because um, I guess even in this pandemic, they're going through situations where places aren't accepting cash and things like that. So it's yeah. you know, kind of moving into that space where it's just, uh, you know, it, it encourages, you know, kind of credit and so on again, you Absolutely. know, like we're using those cards. It's tricky, right? To move but it's those. having, it's using debit cards rather mm. than credit. So we can still use plastic. It doesn't need to be a credit card. Um, yeah. And I've got clients where, uh, they had, they've got a debit card for their bills account and a debit card for their everyday account. And on their everyday account, they've written go. And on their bills account, they've written stop because they know that sometimes if they really want something, they'll hand over their bills account because they know there's money in there and they'll ignore the everyday account. And they've had, when they've tried to do it, the shopkeeper have said, do you really, this has got stop on it. Do you, are you should you be using that? And they go, oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I probably need that. <laughs> uh, but it's setting up those yeah. habits where, um, and you make a great point. The problem with digitized payments is we don't feel pain. And the problem with credit is research shows we spend up to 100% more from using credit because we don't, the insular region in our brain isn't activated. So we don't feel pain. So it's so, creating that pain or or putting boundaries around how much we're able to spend. So so is there a real, does, does things like Afterpay and ZipPay concern you, those kind of things? Because it's Absolutely. that kind of medium ground, right, where you're yeah. kind of, okay, sure, you're not going into, well, in some you can go into credit and get charged for those, but let's say mm -hmm. that the, the ones that um, that you do pay off, but then you're still spending, effectively spending your own money that you don't have. It's kind of like like you yeah. say, taking money from the bills account, right? Yeah. So after paying Zipco and all those are really curious. And one of the trends as a result of the pandemic is we stopped using cash. We started using credit, but most important, uh, the biggest trend is buy now, pay later. So that exploded as a result of the pandemic. Um, and my issue with buy now, pay later is two things. One is we're putting it on credit and people will argue they're budgeting tools, but we're, it's still a form of credit. But the second thing is uh, how there's, some, there's, a psychi there's a pricing psychology mechanism where um, those of us that have businesses understand that if we want you to buy something, we won't sell it to you for $1,000. We'll sell it to you for $9.97. But then more than that, if we can slice up the payments, your brain will go, oh, this is not costing me $1,000. Yeah. It's costing me $100 a month. It's nothing. Mm -hmm. So what Afterpay does is it slices up those payments and you don't think, oh, this is costing me $200. You think, oh, this is only costing me 50 bucks because it's sliced up the payment. And so that's where I see the danger. What I know from retailers that have put it on their site is that spending has gone up by at least 30% as a result of putting after pay on the site and that's not from new customers. So existing customers are spending 30% more. And stats that just came out this week um, is that discretionary spending is 17% more than pre-pandemic levels. Yeah. So we have so much uncertainty and yet we're spending 17% more than yeah. before the pandemic happens on discretionary spend. And part okay. of it is because people have grabbed their $10,000, which please don't if you haven't done that. Um, but the other thing is because of people are spending the stimulus payments and they're using buy now, pay later, and they're not realising the effect it's having 
on them overspending and it gets me really riled because well, I, I mean, can I, see it yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not here, here to pretend uh, any otherwise. I mean, uh, the day that Booktopia, uh, I realised Booktopia, oh. which is an online bookshop uh, offer after pay was disastrous for, you know, yeah. for so many reasons. I had books churning up and in fact, it was much more difficult to integrate them into my library without my partner noticing because <laughs> there'd be packages turning up at the door. Well, um, Jimmy's um, near me have a big sign up saying buy now read later oh yeah wow it. <laughs> but what's interesting as well you talk about that and, and it, about splitting it up and it's easy to kind of go okay that's only going to cost me a uh, yes. hundred dollars uh, a fortnight but you don't say to yourself oh this is only 50 bucks i might save that 50 bucks this fortnight you go well it's only 50 bucks so i can't really save anything this month i'll just start next month you know yep. what I mean? so you don't save the 50 dollars, but you Absolutely. do spend 100 with the exact same argument do you know what yeah. i mean like that's and, and you just get used to that hundred dollars going out the door and you think oh i i'm almost at the end of my afterpay oh i can keep doing that because i'm used yeah. to spending that hundred dollars but it's cutting that out and going back to not cash but debit cards instead yeah okay so we've, we've been i mean i think that's a, a fair point to 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 make people uh, kind of think about some of those behaviors but i think as well you talked a little bit and sent in the book as well just about that kind of nurture and, and nature and, and 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 our own money story so is there an element there of being also going okay we understand there's things that are well it's all our responsibility but there's under, under times where we need to be harsh on ourselves but uh, is there also times to be uh, self-compassionate and kind of understand and go you know those times where it isn't you know if you're on a diet and then you eat a donut they're not going okay I've eaten one donut so now Keeping I'm going to go out just going to go and have a massive piece and go to yeah. you know go nuts and so if that's not the goal that you want to do so even if you have bought one thing on after base going okay I recognize that you know what is the, what what about what is it about my behavior that drove me to to do that and how can i kind of see that happening in the future and kind of nip that in the bud maybe is that is that absolutely so i talk about a couple of things in the book uh one's a financial 30-day detox uh which is something i do twice a year to reset me and certainly you can get to that position where you're just thinking i'm just unconsciously spending without being aware of it um and it's in order to reset that, it's going 30 days without spending. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I couldn't possibly do that, you absolutely need <laughs> to do that. Um, but it's also being aware, you know, if I was going to start training for a marathon, which I'm never going to do, um, because again, that's not how I exercise. But if I was going to, I'm not going to be able to walk out tomorrow and run a marathon. It's just not going to happen. It's going to hurt. I'm going to have to build up to it. I'm going to have times when I'm broken, where I'm going to have, I'm going to have to see a physio. I'm not going to be able to run. And I'm actually going to feel like I'm going backwards with my goals. So we have to apply that same thinking to our money. If we're starting to really get serious about our finances and really dig in and we kind of, we need to appreciate that we're not just going to get it right all the time and not to beat ourselves up, but just to go, OK, I'm curious as to why I behave that way. Was it because I was bored? Was it because I was stressed? Was it because I was just I didn't even think about it? It was unconscious. And when that happens next time, what behaviour could I substitute in instead? And in the book I talk about, I have a whole chapter on stress and sabotage. And I recommend keeping a stress log uh, because for 90% of the time we can be amazing with our finances, but often that 10% will undo all of the 90%. So it's working out what, what behaviour can I swap in? Um, and for me, a lot of that behaviour isn't financial. So it might be I'm going to go for, I'm going to exercise for 30 minutes. I'm going to grab a coffee and go and sit out in the sun and just calm down because of that stress. It might be that I'm going to celebrate by buying a bottle of champagne rather than buying something extraordinarily extravagant. And the popping and the experience is going to be the thing that does it for me. Um, or it might be that I um, do some yoga or I meditate, but it's finding though, or I have a beer with some mates, but it's finding those other things that I'm going to do instead rather than going, oh, well, it doesn't work for me. Just going to abandon all those goals that I said I really wanted. 
Yeah, so so uh, there's, uh, I mean, there's so many bits and bobs going on there as well, you know. But again, it's it's that kind of understanding that it's your own money story that you need to kind of recognise some of those uh, little triggers and and then uh, yeah, and just like you say, just doing those things to you know. It's I suppose it's a bit like when you go, uh, they say never go to the shops uh, to do your food shopping hungry, you know, because you start yeah. picking up all those other bits, you know. It's yep. that kind of uh, when you see those triggers, maybe don't jump onto Booktopia. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And certainly there's a lot of people that Friday afternoon, they're a little bit, it's been a tough week, I've got a glass of wine or a beer, I've got my uh, mobile shopping device in my hand, I'm scrolling through social media and that's the moment. If you go back and look, Friday afternoon might be the time that you buy most things. So your habit might be, well, I'm going to put in a 24 hour rule where I can still buy it, I just have to wait 24 hours. I can put it in my yeah. cart, load it up, and if I still yeah. want it in 24 hours, then go for it and that, and that's it that's the key is not saying don't it's about saying make it a part of your plan and a part of your approach not a reaction to a particular thing that happened in the day or just a you know an impulse kind of thing if it's part of your plan then then you'll get you know your goal then you'll get there and you get there without it being in yeah. a budget which Absolutely. is part of your thing <laughs> and Fantastic. Todd, the reason i told so many stories in the book is so you could hear both other people's experiences, but you can hear the raft of habits that people have developed as a result, but also kind of see yourself and go, oh my gosh, I thought I was normal or that was just me and I just had to live with it. But, oh, okay, so that person's doing that and that's what they did instead. Fantastic, I might try that too. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, you know, I guess we're, we're getting towards the end uh, of, of our little chat, but um, I have had a question uh, come through and I'm not sure uh, how this falls in uh, to, to your area, um, but it's certainly something I'm interested in too, mm. which is, uh, this is about how we think about it introspectively, how we, you know, how we think about money for ourselves, but how do we teach that to, to children or how do we show okay, good... good. How do we show that that good? Because like you say, that first step of thinking about why we behave the way that we do or what type of person we are. No one teaches is to think about that in the in the very instance. We've got to go through this whole learning process, which could take 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know? Yeah. So do you have any tips with, Absolutely. with, with for children? So I don't have kids, uh, but I own a preschool. Um, and one thing I know is that kids are just always watching. And when I talk to the mums, one of the things, and certainly friends that are mums that I have, have this real rule around how they talk about food and how they talk about their bodies. Because particularly if they have daughters, they do not want their daughters to grow up with the same hang-ups around food and body issues that they have. So they're being really intentional about that. And it's important to understand that your kids are watching and they're watching conversations about money and they're watching with your language about money. And so what you want to do is to be intentional about that, to share with them why you're making financial decisions as a household, why uh, you're behaving the way that you do. Maybe even starting with little things like talking about money stories or saying, so the reason that we're going, we're not going out for dinner this weekend is because of this situation that's happening with the pandemic, but what's something fun we could do that doesn't cost anything? Um, or even when you come up to Christmas to say, right, so Christmas is going to be a little different this year, but this is your dollar limit. So this is, you're talking kids numeracy as well. Um, so this is your dollar limit. You can go and find anything within dollar limit. You can go to eBay, you can go to Coles, you can go wherever you want, knock yourself out, but this is your dollar limit. Um, but also we want to do something for someone else. So let's let's look at doing that too. So I think we get the concept when it comes to food and body image around how we're teaching our little ones. It's doing the same when it comes to money and starting to recognise, OK, well, if we're fighting about money, what are they picking up as a result of that? If I'm here going, oh, I've had a hard week, I, wanna, I just want to buy something pretty and my child's sitting there, what lesson are they taking from that? Um, so it's having those conversations around the dinner table. You know, my dad, um, he retired at age 53 and retired really well. And I don't know how, he, like I know, in, I know now how he did it, but he never shared that uh, because money wasn't something we talked about. So I wished that it did. And we talked about a lot of stuff, 
we had a, a, a dinner every night together. And I just wish that money was one of the things that we talked about. And I know potentially why he didn't, because I, I think he stressed a lot about money. So he didn't want to share that stress with his family. But I really wished that he had so that we'd learned those lessons with him. So it's realising that you all might not have a great language for it and it might be feel uncomfortable and clunky, but just to start and maybe starting with something as gentle as a money story or uh, maybe it's something uh, like discussing your money type or your money environment or even pocket money or what have you. Yeah, and, and and those conversations being uh, normalised, you know, so mm. it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's that normalisation, isn't it? Going, yeah, you know, because you, because it, you you know, you, when you talk about body image or those kind of things, it's it's normal to understand, you know, you don't say it as as some kind of special treatment no. thing. You just talk about as all having different body shapes, as though that's just perfectly normal and so on. And yep. so, you know, when you have those good conversations, good habits, you talk about it in a in a normal way that it's normal to have these good habits. And sometimes you can have things you want, and sometimes you can't but you need to be intentional about those things then then that yeah. normalizes it and it will hopefully ingrain. realizing sure. as well my parent, my dad used to um, push me towards the perfect professions because you know I was a smart girl and smart girls had to do certain things um so it's so it's realizing that you may even be sending the messages without realizing that this is a money story you're selling your kids and maybe it's about you unpacking for yourself why you're doing that rather than just doing it by default yeah all right well i think look i mean at the end of the day you could go on so much about oh, yeah. <laughs> the way that we talk and uh, the way that we behave around money and the way that we engage with it and and so on and you know who we are and why we behave the way that we do which is what you talk about in your book and i think there's so much that you can go through in your book and that's the reason we often tell people that they can pick up a, a copy because it's not something that you read once put down and forget about it you know it's something that's changing that you, you can constantly get better at and just like you were talking mm -hmm about running a marathon you know it's about constantly engaging with it and get, getting better and you know kind of going back trying this bit focusing on this bit focusing on that bit you know and gradually mm. you get better I assume or at least that's what I'm getting from what you're telling me and, exactly and from exactly right well. yeah so you've summed it up beautifully <laughs> well uh, you can pass that comment on to my boss that's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll get a pay wise and be able to go back to booktopia you never know <laughs> not a go back to booktopia that maybe you could put half of it to booktopia and half of it to savings that's exactly right there you go no it is well, right now, looking after your future self <laughs> yeah and that that digital detox sounds you know something wait the way you absolutely nailed it when you said if you think you possibly couldn't do it then you probably need to do it which is why I probably need to do it <laughs> 30 days. Yep. Yeah, it is excellent. Well, look, um, thank you so much for your time. I know that you're a very busy person and obviously, um, you know, our, our customers will have got a lot from this. It's something that we'll be able to put on our YouTube channel as well. People will be able to come back and just reference that. But we'll, I really do recommend uh, picking up your book uh, that's available around all, all good bookstores, I guess. That's the, the, the comment, yeah, isn't it? But I mean, so CW everywhere, quite every, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's one of those things where yeah, you because you need to go back, you need to ring, read it a few bits at a time and just have a, a little reflection and and think about, uh, yeah, how we all engage. And it doesn't have to be that onerous. It just needs to be intentional, right? And, yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us, Melissa. And, and I'll speak to you again sometime soon. Sounds good. Bye bye.